27, if you would like to open your chapter 27. This is a fascinating There are soldiers, there are under the ship. People are fighting for their life. This story, I want us to consider this question. How do we typically apply Bible stories to our lives? And then consider this question. How would God like us to apply Bible stories to our lives? Because sometimes the way we apply them is not the way God would like us to apply them. And so what happens when we are applying Bible stories in a way different than the way God would like them to be applied in our lives? So before we get into the text, I'll just tell you what's going on in this story to set the scene. Paul is a prisoner. And he is on a boat, and they are sailing for Rome, and Paul is going to have the opportunity to preach the gospel to Caesar himself. So this is a very big deal. The boat, while they're on their way, comes into a port, and the port is called Fair Havens. This must have been a nice place. In order for this port to receive the name Fair Havens, and that's when Paul stands up and speaks. So let's begin with Paul speaking in Acts chapter 27, verse 10. Acts chapter 27, verse 10. And said to them, Men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Paul says to the men, We need to stay right here in Fair Havens. Because if we continue on on this voyage, disaster is waiting for us. We're going to lose everything. We're going to lose the cargo. We're going to lose the boat itself. And some of us are even going to die. And so the question I have is, was this a message from God? Or was this Paul's own opinion? To be honest, the text never says blatantly or straightforwardly, that this was a message from God. It's possible that this is Paul's own opinion. He's looking around and he's come to this conclusion and it's his own personal thoughts. However, later on in the passage when Paul speaks, Paul is speaking the word of God. He's received a message from God and he is communicating the message to the people. I would like us to assume for the time being that this is a message from God. Paul is the prophet of God. Paul is you know, speaking the word of God at this time. And so if this were a message from God, then how does that affect the story and what goes on in this story? So imagine this. Paul receives a message from God and he communicates it to the people on the boat. God says, we need to stay here in Fair Haven. We are right where God wants us to be. But if we go out and continue on our journey, disaster awaits us. We are going to lose everything. We are going to lose the cargo. We are going to lose the boat itself. And many of us are going to die. Now, what happens next? Take a look at verse 11. Acts 27, verse 11. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul. So, the... um. The centurion. The centurion says, God says this, but the pilot and the captain are saying something different. And I think that what the pilot and the captain are saying makes a lot more sense than what God says to us. And so he is is tempted to reject the word of God and follow the logic of men. We have the wisdom of men, the logic of men versus the word of God, and he has to make a choice. And it sounds like the exact same situation Adam and Eve were in in the Garden of Eden. Because God said, on the day you eat from this tree, you will surely die. And Satan comes along and Satan says, you will not surely die, but you will be better off for eating this fruit. And Adam and Eve have to make a choice. We can trust in the word of God or we can trust in the logic of men or the wisdom of some other being that is not God. And so what are we going to choose? And of course, Adam and Eve rejected the word of God and they chose to follow the logic of men. And as a result, 
Sin and death entered into the world, and paradise was lost. What might happen to these sailors if they choose to reject the word of God and follow the, the logic of men? So take a look at verse 12. Verse 12 says, Because the harbor was not suitable for wintering, the majority reached the decision to put out to sea from there if somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. So what we see is the majority reached a decision. Where we are right now is not a good place. There are better places for us out there and down the road. We need to continue on our journey because we can find a better place than where we are right now. Even though God told them that where you are right now is exactly where you need to be. But they decided that we're not satisfied with where we are right now. There's probably something better up ahead. And we're just going to go a little bit further, not too much further, maybe just to the other side of the island where we could find a better harbor and a better port and we would be better protected there. That also sounds like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. I mean, God had given them all the fruits of the tree the fruit of the trees that existed with the exception of one tree. All of their needs were met. They had, they had everything they needed, but they weren't satisfied with what they were given. They wanted what they did not have. And so these men are in a similar situation. Now, one of the things we see here in verse um, 12 is that the majority reached a decision. The majority reached a decision which was contradictory to the word of God and so we're going to do what the majority decided to do. The majority is not always right. Just because the majority of people think something to be the best option does not make it the best option or the right option. The word of God is always right. The word of God is always the, the best option and the only option we can base our lives upon. The word of God is trustworthy. It is accurate. It is true. And it is right. And so we need to base our decisions for our lives on the word of God and not the logic of men, especially when the logic of men contradicts the word of God. Now, the majority of people did not get on board Noah's ark and they perished in the flood. And the majority of the spies decided, let's not go into the promised land, but instead let's go back to Egypt and return to a life of slavery. And they perished in the wilderness. And so if we follow the majority, chances are things are not going to turn out well for us, physically or spiritually. And so, because the majority decided, they reject the word of God, they leave the port of fair havens, and they continue on their journey. And what happens is a huge storm comes upon the boat. And the boat is blown off course. And in fact, they lose control of the boat. And the winds and the waves are tearing the boat apart. And they realize that they're in a very desperate situation. So take a look at verse 18. Verse 18. The next day, as they were being violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo. The situation is so desperate that we've got to throw the cargo overboard. This cargo was valuable. I mean... Why are you selling to Rome? I, I don't know what the cargo was, but imagine they've got goods and products and things that they're going to sell in Rome. This is their livelihood. Like our economic future is dependent upon this cargo. It is super valuable. But the storm was so severe and they were in such a desperate situation that they realized the only hope we have to save ourselves is to get rid of the cargo. They're literally throwing their livelihood overboard in order to lighten the ship, to bring it up higher in the waters or something so that it doesn't get uh, sunk in the, in the waters. So they're losing their cargo. Take a look at verse 20. Verse 20. Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small storm was assailing us, from then on all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. The situation was so desperate that they lost all hope. There's no chance for us to survive. We're all going to die. It's a hopeless, desperate situation. And this is when 
Paul speaks. So take a look at verse 21. Verse 21 says, When they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. In other words, I told you so. You should have listened to me. But nobody really likes that person, right? The guy who says, I told you so. Uh, when it says here, you should have followed my advice. In English, that sounds like this was just Paul's opinion. It was Paul's opinion that we should have stayed in Fair Havens because disaster awaits us if we continue on our journey. However, in Greek, what the word, is, the, the Greek word that is translated here, followed my advice. The Greek word literally means to obey authority. To obey authority. So Paul's advice was authoritative. Paul was speaking authoritatively. And what he is saying is, you should have obeyed the authority of the words that I spoke to you. Why would Paul be speaking authoritatively? He's a prisoner on the ship. He has no control over the ship. He's not the captain. He's not the centurion. He's not in charge. But I think this might be an indication that the message was from God. That's why it was authoritative. It was the word of God. God had spoken to Paul and God said, you need to stay in fair havens. Because if you leave, disaster is waiting for you. And so maybe this was a message from God. So take a look at verses 22 to 25. Verse 22. Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. One of the things we see here is that the word of God is always accurate. Paul says, God has granted everyone who is on this boat to live. We're not going to die. We're all going to survive. And I believe that what God says will be true. Because my God is faithful. He is trustworthy. He is honest. And he is capable of saving us from this storm. Even though the storm was so severe that they had lost all hope of survival, Paul says there is always hope in God. Because God is able to save. Even in an impossible situation, God can rescue us. So he says, take courage. Take courage. You can take courage because you trust in God. God is the source of our courage. God is the source of our hope. God is the source of our lives and our safety and our security. And so we put our faith in God and we can face the storm courageously. Not because we're such brave people, but because we serve an awesome God. However, because you rejected the word of God and chose to set off on your own course, there are consequences. Even though you will not die, you're going to lose things. You're going to lose all the cargo. All that money that you have waiting for you, it's gone. And you're going to lose the boat itself. Okay, there are consequences when we reject the word of God and choose to disobey him and set out on our own path. Take a look at verses 29 and 30. Verse 29. Fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. But as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's boat into the sea on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow, so there were some sailors who realized we're all going to die and we've got to save ourselves. And so they get into a little dinghy, a life raft or something. They, they lower it down. And under the pretense of setting up anchors, we're going to escape. We're getting out of here. Like, we're leaving those guys behind and we're saving ourselves. And they're motivated by fear. They fear that they are going to die. Why would they fear that they are going to die when they've just received a message from God saying, nobody is going to die? 
You see, they don't trust in God. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in the trustworthiness of the word of God or in the trustworthiness of God himself. And so again, they're turning their backs on God and doing something against the word of God. And so take a look at verse 31. Verse 31 says, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. There's a connection here. If these guys jump ship and take off, then all bets are off. The, the promise that God made to save everyone, that's not going to happen. If some people abandon ship, all of you are in jeopardy. And so your lives are dependent upon those sailors getting back on board the boat. So take a look at verses 33 and 34. Until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken nothing. Therefore, I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your preservation. For not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. Now Paul says you need to eat something. You're going to need your strength. You're going to need to, to make a pretty large swim. It's going to be difficult. The waves and the winds are crashing all around you. You're going to have to swim for your life. So you've got to prepare for that. You need to eat some, strength, eat some food to gain some strength. But one thing that Paul says is, not a single hair from the head of any of you will perish. Why will not a single hair from the any of them perish? Take a look at the very next verse. Verse 35 says, Having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all, and he broke it and began to eat. Now, I think this is a common meal. We need to eat something because we need to have our strength when we make this swim. Okay, so they ate a meal. But the language of the verse is reminiscent of the Lord's Supper, is it not? Notice what he says in verse 35. He took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. This is supposed to remind us of the Lord's Supper. And so there's a bigger point here than just eat some food to get some strength because you've got to swim. Why is it that not a single hair of your head will perish? It's because of what Jesus has accomplished for us. It's because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that we will survive, that we will live, that we will have salvation, that we will have eternal life. We will be saved because of the sacrifice of Jesus. And so we should see that connection in the words that are used to describe this meal. Take a look at verse 36 and 37. All of them were encouraged, and they themselves also took food. All of us in the ship were 276 persons. There are 276 people on board this ship. 276 people in a desperate situation. So what happens is the storm blows the ship into a reef amongst the rocks, and, and the, the storm is ripping the ship apart. And everyone realizes we're all going to die. But God told them, you're not going to die. You're all going to live. And so they say, we've got to abandon ship. And they're told that everyone who knows how to swim, jump overboard and swim. And if you don't know how to swim, find something to hold on to because this ship is going down. But what happens, take a look at verse 44. Verse 44 says, and the rest should follow, some on planks, and others on various things from the ship. And so it happened that they all were brought safely to land. Wow. Can you imagine? Everyone was brought safely to land. Why were they brought safely to land? Because God granted to them that they would live. It is by the mercy of God that they're going to live. Even though they rejected the word of God. Even though they turned their backs on God and set off on their own path. God has not abandoned them. God is still with them. And God says, by the mercy of me, I will allow you to live. I will save you. God delivered them. 
276 people arrived on shore, and they all lived. So, how do we typically apply Bible stories like this to our lives? I believe that we probably typically apply these Bible stories individualistically, as if this story is talking about me. This story is talking about Stephen Curro. So how do we read these things? You are on a journey. You are in the port of Fair Havens. God says to you, you are in a good place. You are right where I want you to be. Stay here. Don't leave. But you think to yourself, this isn't such a good place. There's probably a better place somewhere down the road. And so I'm just going to venture out a little ways and just see. Maybe there's something better for me somewhere else. And so you reject the word of God and you set off on your own path. And what happens when you do that is storms come into your life. And so there's 14 days of storms. And the storms become so severe that eventually you realize you're losing everything. Everything that mattered to you, everything that was valuable to you is suddenly not so valuable anymore. You've got to get rid of it and you're throwing cargo overboard. You're letting go. But the situation is so desperate that you realize there's no hope. There's no hope to recover. There's no hope to survive. And that's when God speaks. And God says, have you learned your lesson? I'm still here. I haven't abandoned you. You're not going to perish. I'm going to rescue you. You're going to live. But because you have disobeyed me, there are consequences. You're going to have to deal with the loss of these things. But hopefully by now you've learned that those things are not as valuable as you once thought they were. Now, what happens in Acts chapter 28, everyone arrived safely to an island. And there were people living on the island. Many of those people were sick. And so they brought them to Paul, and by the power of God, Paul was healing those who were sick. And he preaches the gospel, and people are responding to the word of God. People are blessed by Paul and the power of God and Christianity and the hope of Jesus as a result of everything that happened. And sometimes God can use your redemption story to impact and bless the lives of other people. Now, it's better for you not to have a redemption story in the sense that I rejected the word of God and I went down on my own path and I made a mess of my life and then I repented and I came back to God and I was forgiven and Things were restored, and now I can share my story with those around me and maybe bless some other people. Don't reject the word of God so that you will come up with a redemption story that you can share. But if you've made a mess of things and then you've been restored to God, and use that to, to bless others. You know, God can use your redemption story. But the point I'm making is this. We tend to apply these stories individualistically, as if this was a story about Stephen Curro. You know, what makes you think that this is a story about you? Well, we live in a culture that has trained us to think and live as an individual. You know, we applaud and honor those who, who have raised themselves up by their own bootstraps, so to speak. Like, I did it on my own. I worked hard and I accomplished it and, and I did it. And so we applaud you for that. You know, the rugged frontiersman uh, who's off in the wilderness by himself surviving. We love those shows, like Alone, uh, things like that. We're fasc I'm fascinated. I want to watch it. I want to see how you survive alone in the wilderness. You know, that seems, that's intrigued. There's something about it that intrigues me. All right? But we've been trained to think very individualistically. The thing is, historically speaking, people who lived on planet Earth didn't survive and thrive on their own. But they understood the value of community. They were part of a village. They were part of a community, and they were dependent on one another in order for their survival. In other words, if it's all about me and what's best for me, there's no community. And the village is going to suffer if it's all about me. But if I put the needs of the village ahead of my own personal needs, and I'm working to bless the village, and if everyone is doing that, then everyone is going to be blessed. 
Like, we're stronger together than we are apart as individuals. And so we need to think about the collective whole first. Rather than think about me as an individual first. Can a fingernail leave the body and survive? In fact, can any organ leave the body and survive on its own? And the answer is, of course not. Apart from the body, the organ is going to die. It cannot survive on its own. It needs the body. And the same thing is true for us as well. So this is not a story about Jesus and me. But this is a story about Jesus and the church. It's a story about the community of the people of God and how they work together in relationship to Jesus, our Lord and Savior. So turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we see the first century Christians, the first Christians, in fact. These Christians understood that they needed a community. And so what do they do? Take a look at Acts 2, verses 42 to 46. Verses 42 to 46. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together, and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions, and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. These were people who understood the essentiality of being a part of a community. It wasn't just me as an individual having a relationship with Jesus, but it was us as a people together, sharing life together, having a relationship with Jesus. They needed the church. They needed the body of Christ. They needed a spiritual family. And that's what God wants for us and for his people. These were not people who just showed up for one hour on Sunday morning and then went their own way. No one saw them again for the rest of the week. No, they were together. They were sharing life together. They were spending time together. They were building relationships with one another. They were serving one another. They were serving God together. They were praising God together. The church was their life. Not something they did for an hour on Sundays. But it was everything to them. And they understood the value of it and the essentiality of it. Take a look at Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. Acts 4, 32 to 35. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet. And they would be distributed to each as any had need. Here we see a group of people who put the needs of the community ahead of their own personal needs. They were willing to sacrifice in order to bless the family of God. And that's the kind of community that God wants his people to be. So, we need to work on our pronouns. I should be we. And me should be us. Because I'm not doing this by myself. I'm not serving God alone as an individual. But we are a family. We are a body. We are a community of believers. We are the people of God. Jesus is going to come to save the body. That is the church. And we are a part of the church. And so we need to be thinking not about me as an individual. 
but about us as the body of Christ. So turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. And we'll read verses 9 to 13. Matthew chapter 6. Verses 9 to 13. Matthew 6 verse 9. It says, Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Do you notice the pronouns that are being used here in this passage? This is the model prayer. When you pray, pray like this. How should you pray? What should be on your heart? What should be on your mind? It says, our Father. In verse 11, it says, give us our daily bread. Verse 12, forgive us as we forgive our debtors. Verse 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. How many of us read this this way? How many of us apply the model prayer this way? I know that in my life, I've read it like this. My Father who is in heaven, verse 11, give me this day my daily bread. Verse 12, forgive me as I forgive those who have sinned against me. Verse 13, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. It's all very individualistic. It's all very self-centered and self-focused. But there's not a single individual pronoun used here. They're all plural. It's not about me as an individual. It's about us as a family, as a community. I should be praying for the, the, the blessings of God to be upon the church and upon my brothers and sisters in Christ. Give us this day our daily bread. And then I should be working to help provide for the needs of the body of Christ. Take a look also at Ephesians chapter 4. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 2. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another... In love. Also in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. We need to be working to bless the body of Christ. Not trying to do what I can for myself, but rather, what can I do to be a blessing to the body of Christ? How can I serve the church? How can I serve my brothers and sisters in Christ? If I am a pinky finger, I need to get stronger. I need to be stronger. Uh, uh, I need to be a stronger pinky finger. But why? Not so that I can be the strongest pinky finger that there is, but rather so that I can help the hand lift more things. So that I can help the hand do more things. So that we together can do more things for the glory of God. That's why I, I need to be the best version of myself for the sake of the body of Christ. So,
One of the things we're seeing here is that community is more important than the individual. Not that the individual doesn't matter. Of course, the individual matters. But when I'm living my life, I shouldn't be living as an individual seeking my own interests, but rather putting the interests of the body of Christ as the top priority in what I do. Don't just show up on Sunday morning, get what you need, and then disappear. But rather be invested in the life of the church. Be involved in what's going on with the church. We're going to be getting together tonight at 6 p.m. It's family dinner. And some of you might think, what a waste of time. We're not doing anything. Just getting together to eat. That's it. I, I don't need to be here for that. But those of us who do come, we're having fellowship with one another. We're building relationships with one another. We're sharing life with one another. We're encouraging one another. We're stronger together because of the time that we spend together than we are as individuals. Spend time with one another. Take someone out to dinner. Invite someone over to your house for lunch. Go help someone work on a project that they're doing. Call, give someone a call. Text someone. Talk to one another. Be involved in the lives of one another and building relationships with one another. So going back to our story in Acts chapter 27, this is not a story about Jesus and Steve. This is a story about Jesus and the church. So we are on a journey together. There was 276 people in the boat. It wasn't one man alone. They were all together. They were in the port of Fair Havens. God says, you're right where I want you to be. Stay here. Don't leave. Because if you leave, disaster awaits. But we look around and say, there's something better for us than where we are right now. And the majority makes a decision. Let's reject the word of God and do something else. Let's go down our own path. So we set off down our own path. Maybe we justify it by saying, we're not really going that far. You know, we're just going to the other side of the island. It's still close enough that we're basically obeying God. But we leave and go down our own path. And what happens is storms come into our lives. And there's suffering and there's loss of things that once were valuable to us. We have to get rid of those things. And we find ourselves in a desperate situation. We find ourselves in a hopeless situation. We can go astray by liberalism. In other words... We can decide to do things that we don't have authority to do. Biblical authority. And so we can be carried away by liberalism. We can go astray by legalism. We can, we can live our lives in such a way that we don't have the spirit of Christ or the love of Christ. And we can be carried off in a storm of legalism as well. But God says, I want you to stay in fair havens. That's where you need to be. And so when... After suffering loss and, and losing all hope, God steps in and he says, I haven't abandoned you. Even though you've disobeyed me, I'm still here and I'm going, to, I'm going to deliver you. But take courage. Trust in God. Eat something. Regain your strength. You're going to need it. I mean, there are consequences for your disobedience. You're going to suffer loss and it's going to be a hard road to recovery. But I'm going to help you get there. Okay, so take a look at Acts chapter 27, verse 24. Acts 27, verse 24. Acts 27, verse 24. Saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. We're all going to survive. We're all going to make it. We're all going to live. We're all going to be saved. We are all going to have eternal life. Take a look at verses 29 and 30. Verses 29 and 30. Fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. But as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship, the ship's boat into the sea, on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow, some people might decide, 
I got to abandon ship. I got to get out of here. I got to save myself. They were motivated by fear. And they were really putting themselves at risk. They weren't going to save themselves. God said, here is where you're going to find salvation. But if you want to abandon ship, you're not going to find salvation somewhere else. You know, stay with the people of God. That's what he's saying. Now, these people wanted to leave the people of God and go out on their own course. But what about those they left behind in the boat? I don't care about those left in the boat. I only care about myself. Like, can you see how a selfish attitude can be detrimental to the body of Christ? So look at verse um, 31. Verse 31 says, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. You remaining in the body is going to have an impact on the rest of the body. And if you leave the body, it's going to hurt the body of Christ. Don't leave. But instead, work for the salvation of the body of Christ. Take a look at verse 42. Verse 42. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners so that none of them would swim away and escape. God says, no one's going to die. I'm going to rescue all of you. And the soldiers say, well, someone's going to die. We're going to see to it that these guys don't survive. We don't want them having a chance to survive. Like, we're going to kill the prisoners? Why are you going to kill the prisoners when God said everyone is going to live? You know, don't sabotage someone else's salvation. Don't sabotage someone else's relationship with Jesus. That's the opposite of how we should be working together in the church. But take a look at verses 43 and 44. 43 and 44. But the centurion, wanting to bring Paul safely through, kept them from their intention and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. And the rest should follow, some on planks, and other on various things from the ship. And so it happened that they were all brought safely to land. Everyone survived. Everyone lived. Everyone was saved. That should be our goal as the people of God. It's not just about me and Jesus. It's about us and Jesus. I want everyone to be saved. That's why we have elders. The elders are shepherds who are watching out for the spiritual well-being of the flock. Uh, they're, they're, they're in charge with making sure that everyone survives. Like there may be soldiers here who want to kill some of us. Like we got to we, we not let these people make it. No, someone's got to step in and say, that's not happening. You know, we're all going to make it together. We're all going to survive together. We're all going to be saved together. This is our approach to the body of Christ, to our lives as Christians in the church, that it is about us and not about me. We're going to offer an invitation at this time. If you have kind of felt like you're on the fringes of the church, come on in. We invite you to come on in, uh, to be more involved, more committed to the church. And if you need help doing that, we want you to be invested in the body of Christ because Jesus is the Savior of the body. And if you would like to respond to this message, please come forward at this time as we stand and sing.